So last week we officially launched into our study and we're going to kind of jump right in. I'm going to take about three minutes for a brief review of what we talked about last week. If you missed last week, please take the time to listen either online or the, re- the, the, the visual online, the live stream that we post there on the YouTube channel, or go and find the recording. Because really what we talked about last week sets up for this entire study. It's the context for our study. We're going to refer often to what we talked about last week. So if you missed it, please take the time this week to go back and look. But what we talked about last week is... We tried to answer a couple key questions about Romans. How did we get Romans? Why was Romans written? What is Romans all about? And on that last question, we kind of dialed in on some themes through the book of Romans. You will remember these, and hopefully you're starting to look for these signposts on this journey through Romans. Here's the first one we talked about. The righteousness of a sovereign God. This is going to be unpacked through the book of Romans. Another theme. Here it is. The gospel, the good news of a glorious Christ. That is going to be unpacked as we go through the book of Romans. Here's a third theme that we will see. And a lot of people kind of set this aside. But this is in this book. Especially as we come to the, the middle sections. And into the final sections of this book. We find the enablement of the powerful spirit. So this is a very Trinitarian book. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. All involved in our lives. Compelling us to grow. Okay. So this book Romans. Is not a little pretty bedtime story. This is a book that is meant to absolutely transform our lives from the inside out. Um, here's a question that we kind of interacted with this week, and maybe this has been on your mind, and I, I know it kind of touches on a couple of the nuances of righteousness, and, and, and it is a broad spectrum, the whole concept of righteousness, but this question, and hopefully you've been asking yourself this question, how Can a righteous God make an unrighteous person righteous and do it in a righteous way? Let me ask that one more time, because this ought to be going on in our minds. This is the question that flows through the book of Romans. How can a righteous God make an unrighteous person righteous, but do it in a righteous way? And right away in the book of Romans, we're confronted with this word, good news. It's the gospel. What's the answer to this question? It is the the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And we find this in the verses that that, that Chuck just read. Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. And I hope your Bibles are, are, are opened up to Romans 1. And by the way, this is one of those studies where, boy, I hope we put our thinking caps on. We can't put it in neutral and just coast through the next 45 minutes. Hold on, here we go. But Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul, through the Spirit of God, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And who is that everyone? It involves both Jews and Greeks. To the Jews first and also to the Greeks. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. All right, so that might have been a little longer than three minutes, but we're rolling. Here we are in our cars. You know what it's like about to go on a journey. Everyone's crammed in the car. You got all the snacks you need. You got the map highlighted on your lap. You got your GPS set, if that's what you need to go with. Windows are rolled down. Vehicles full of fuel. And the road is in front of us. Well, here we are in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And to set the pace, let's just read through these again. We can't read through these enough. Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7, starting with verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, 
set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you, who are called to belong to to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning we're going to try to unpack these seven verses and get as far as we can through them. But to start off, remind ourselves that we are in what is known as the information age. What am I talking about? We're talking about the 21st year of the 21st century. We are currently living in the technology age. Basically this. Technology has placed information and communication on overdrive and overload. <laughs> Okay, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, here's what I'm talking about. Ten years ago, 35% of y'all, 35% of adults held in their hands what's known as a smartphone. Okay. 2021, an estimated 90% of adults have in their hands a smartphone. Information is on overdrive and overload. And that doesn't even include all of those teenagers in this room right now who are glued to their phones. Just joking. Kind of. Technology. Phones. And by the way, of the 90% of us in this room who have these phones in our hands and actually following through, you're reading the Bible mostly on your phones right now. That little notification comes up and you do your best to try to ignore it. But one thing is certain that 100% of us still don't know how to put those phones on silent. <laughs> That's the case. I never forget several. <laughs> all the eyes turn towards certain individuals in this room. No, it's all of us. But whatever the case is, we are in this information age, this technology age. And one of the, you wouldn't think this, but one of the archaic ways of passing messages along is actually that little button on your phones that says voicemail. Archaic, what are you talking about? It kind of is. It's getting to the place where people don't often use voicemails anymore. But if you do, you can identify a couple different voicemails. Some are really good at this, all right? And by, and by the way, if, you, if you're like me, my phone never stops all week long, even in the middle of the night. <laughs> I think some of you know what I uh, can identify with that. It's going, it's going, it's buzzing, it's ringing, all. And I just have to sometimes, I'm sorry if I don't get back to you right away, but I have to take that thing and put it far from me. Kind of like sin. <laughs> but this thing keeps going. Where was I going with this? All right, voicemails. These voicemail greetings, some, some of you will get on there, and, and you know what it's like. You listen to your voicemail, and it's very to the point. All right. They're short, they're sweet, to the point. Hey, this is so-and-so. Hey, if you have time, give me a call. Boom, done. There's other voicemails. Well, you know where I'm going with this. That aren't so short. They're long. And after a two-minute nap, you finally realize that they're done talking. You understand what I mean? That's okay. But there's some voicemails that are short and they really don't say much. There's other voicemails that are long. And by the way, if you left a long voicemail on my phone this week, that's okay. I still listen to them. Most of them anyways. But these voicemails, they're long. And the fact of the matter is sometimes whether they're short or long, these voicemails sometimes don't say anything. There was a, fa a, a, there was a close friend of mine in the church we were at in, in Colorado. Man, he thought voicemail time was the time to talk to no end. He just kept talking, 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 talking about everything, eating up my entire voicemail capacity. All right, so voicemails. We're trying to stay on task here. Voicemails, short, 
Sometimes don't say anything, just necessary information. Long, sometimes don't say anything, just necessary information. But there's other voicemails that you get. You know, you tap on this thing and you listen to it and every single word means something. We're talking about details. Meet here at this time, bring this, and bring this person as well. And you're listening to it, you're trying to write down, and what do you do? You have to go back through several times because there is very pertinent information in every word of this greeting. Okay? I want us to look at Romans 1, 1 through 7 that way. This is a very, very, very meaningful greeting. All right, we're going through seven verses here, and every single word matters. And you get through this, and, and, and my imagination was going this week, and I, I'm picturing the Apostle Paul speaking this out, and Tertius, his, his quill is already on fire, because he's like, whoa, slow down. And, Peter's, and Paul's like, no, catch this, get this, get this. And he's writing down, and he gets to the end of actually verse 17, because that's when the salutation greeting ends. But he gets to the end of verse 17, and, and Tertius is like, Paul, that was a great epistle. And Paul's like, dude, we're just getting going. Hold on, here it comes. That's how meaningful I believe this greeting is. Every single word matters. In my mind, I think about the church of Rome as they're reading this, as it's being passed around to different believers in the church and Different groups coming together, congregations coming together, and whatever elder, pastor, bishop stands up before the congregation and reads this greeting. And they're listening with eyes wide open, ears perked up, and they're listening to this ver- these, these, these paragraphs and this paragraph, and they're intent on what's said, and they're like, uh, hey, yo, whatever the elder's name is, can you read that again? <laughs> I got like... of that. Okay, that is what this greeting is. It is so packed full of meaning. Every single verse matters. And Paul, the apostle, through the Spirit of God, is giving us details that we need to attach ourselves to. Why? Because you know what this greeting is doing? It is setting the pace and setting the stage for the rest of this book. So what we're going to do this morning is just look at some of these details in this greeting that mean a ton. This very important voicemail that we're getting here through the Spirit written in the Word of God. And let's start with this first detail. Starting with verse 1. And what we're going to do, just, just to give you a heads up, we're just going to work through these one word at a time, one phrase at a time, all the way through the next seven verses. Pull some Structure together through this, and then bring some application. Pray God's grace, and go home. That's the plan today. (laughs) All right? So let's start with verse 1. First word, Paul. A servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. What is this? Very clearly, Romans was written through a devoted, here it is servant of Christ. Again, this sets the stage for the rest of this book. We spent last time working through, last week, looking at the fact that Paul's life was sovereignly sculpted by God for ministry. What am I talking about? Well, his upbringing in the Greek culture, his, his uh, tag to Roman citizenship, his education in, in Jewish elitism from an elite Jewish leader, Gamaliel, in an elite Jewish group, a group sect, the Pharisees. This is what Paul's life was consumed with, elitism. But in all of this, all of how the Apostles Paul, Paul's life was sculpted, It comes down to one event in his life that radically transformed the way he saw everything and did anything. It was on the road to Damascus when he was going to persecute Christians that Jesus Christ said, Paul, you're mine! Changed his life. 
And I believe constantly as he's talking of this, and, and, and I don't want to paint too much of a, of a picture. My mind goes, but I think sometimes as Paul's writing this, I think very possibly there are just going to be tears trickling down his face. And Tertius is like, yeah, I'm ready. This pen's still on fire, brother. And Paul's like, just give me a second. Tertius, don't write this. Jesus rescued me. He changed my life, Tertius. Okay, let's get back to writing. And how does Paul consider himself here right away in this book? Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. This man whose life was consumed with elitism, the Greek culture, the Roman citizenship, the Judaism, all of this that is making a case for himself to climb a ladder to be, honestly, one of the most brilliant people in the first century. And now, in Rome, a place considered special for its Roman elitism, Paul says, yeah, but I'm a servant. I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. Paul here uses a word in the Greek New Testament called doulos. You've heard of this word. Some version, versions of your Bible will translate it like this one that we're reading from the ESV, bond servant or servant. And I, but, but I think, based on other words used, I think that kind of softens the meaning of this word. I think probably a word that might have a more deep cut in our culture, our current culture, is the word slave. Slave. A slave of Jesus. Some commentators believe this is referring to voluntary slavery. A voluntary slave who willingly and happily places himself under the authority of an, another. I must say this doesn't seem to like it has historically concrete evidence behind it. It's a, it's a neat theory and fun to talk about, but I don't know that you can make a strong case for that. But whether, whether it is voluntary leading to a more dynamic slavery or involuntary, whatever the case may be, the idea here is of absolute, complete ownership by, ownership by and devotion to the authority of a master. I mean, this sets the stage for this book. I mean, we're talking about a relationship with this God that is not like this little sweet thing that's like, oh, this is cute. This is a lifelong devotion to follow Jesus. And Paul says, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I am a slave. Paul, what does Paul mean? It's a Greek term that means little. He's the little dude. It might have been given him as a nickname because very well, he might have been really short. That's what a lot of people think. He was a little short guy with a lot of energy. Amen, Brother Rick? Short with a lot of energy. Reminds me of my Grandpa Blue who preached from this pulpit for years and years. Short with endless energy. Still has 95 years old, has energy that I'm like, Grandpa, where did you get that energy? This guy Paul, his name meaning little. But this man Paul, this little guy, intentionally designated himself as a servant, a submissive slave. And get this though, when you think of slavery, you're like, oh, that's something we need to kind of not talk about as much. No, no, no. Paul embraces it. Why? Because this is a wonderful master. That's what we're getting in this book. It's okay to be a slave when your master is great. And that's what Paul is saying. I am a servant of Jesus, and he's wonderful. As Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, a servant of the Messiah Savior, the promised rescuer, also calls himself or considers himself, he talks here through the Spirit, he uses another descriptive phrase, called to be an apostle. Okay, right away in this we need to realize that the first phrase he uses is something that's enticing us to be like, a servant of Jesus Christ. The second phrase he uses here is not one that he's like, yes, and you need to be this as well. No, that's not the purpose for this phrase. This phrase is what we call apostolic authority. Authority. 
He's saying, yes, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, but you need to listen up to what I have to say because I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time about that today, but I will tell you, this is not compelling to me to say, okay, you need to be an apostle, and you need to be an apostle, and you need to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's not what this is talking about. But nonetheless, Paul says, I have been called to be an apostle. And he uses that word there, C-A-L-L-E-D, which is so important in the book of Romans. We need to grasp this word, called. Called, used two more times, even in this first seven verses. The first time to refer to Paul himself, the second two times to compel the believers and say, yes, as I was called, now you're called to something. As I was called to be an apostle, you're not called to be that apostle like me, but you are called to something else. You are called to belong to Jesus. We're going to get there in just a minute. You're called to belong to Jesus, and you are called to be a saint. Oh, man, that's going to be a fun discussion in just a couple minutes. Called. This indicates, and catch this, it's an intentional choice that leads to a purposeful acquisition. That's what we're talking about right away in this book. Paul's point is that he has if. He was effectively chosen by God not only to be saved, but to minister as an apostle. Again, this is not referring to generally one sent out with the glorious gospel. That's not what this is referring to. This is specifically talking about one of Christ's chosen and authoritative apostles used by God particularly for a certain point in redemptive history. We're talking about 12 plus 1, Paul. And Paul talks about this if you go through his testimony of faith in Philippians chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We find Paul's testimony about this. Very quickly, but very appropriately, because especially in this town, we're talking about Redding, California, we need to work through this concept. This apostleship that Paul is referring to here is not for today. We do not have present-day apostles. We have present-day Bible. Catch that. We do not have present-day apostles. We have present-day Bible that is written by the apostles. We do not need a new apostolic reformation. We need a newfound appreciation for the Word of God. That's what we need. We need a revival of people that are committed to obeying God's Word. I'm not trying to self-identify myself as one of the elite apostles, but humble servants of God that say, no, I'm going to follow what God wrote 2,000 years ago. That is the reformation we need. The reformation of God's Word changing our hearts because God used His apostles to write the Scriptures. Paul was one of the first century apostles who had seen Christ personally on the road to Damascus. He had been selected specifically by Christ and had been empowered by the Spirit to write Scripture. This term held extreme weight in the first century. Brothers and sisters, please recognize this. It held great weight in the first century. Paul's writing in Romans came with authority because he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. So if you want to kind of summarize this phrase, called to be an apostle, here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, listen up. In verse 1, Paul refers to himself not only as a servant of Christ, which we should all attempt to be, but also as one particularly chosen by Christ and as an esteemed apostle who we should listen to. One last description. By the way, this is, this is fun because it was, I know right now you're, your interest is getting perched. You're like, whoa, hold on. You got you to describe that a little bit more. Not today. I'd love to have more conversations with you all and, and any one of the elders. This is, this is not something we don't talk about. This is very important to the philosophy of ministry here at Cross Point Community Church. But let's go to this third statement by Paul here. Let's dial in on this one. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of Christ. Simply, the boundary of his ministry had been set. Paul had been appointed to a new duty. 
Here's your duty, Paul. All right. Um, in my mind, I think of the military. In the last two years, my two oldest nephews, uh, Tim Jr. and Titus, have both enlisted in military service. And both of them have gone through special training. Here is your duty. Here is what you'll be trained to do. And in my mind, I think that's kind of what Paul's, Paul's talking about here. Hey, I have a special duty. And what's the special duty? The gospel. The gospel to the nations. That's your calling order. The gospel. And from the onset in this book, Paul's like, yep, it's so important that it is my exclusive duty to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. This gospel is the good news that originated with God himself. How do we know that? Well, look how it's titled here. Set apart for the gospel of Paul. And that's not what it says. It is the gospel of God. The good news is from God. Paul's life was consumed with proclaiming this good news. This is a good news that originated with God himself and was owned by God himself. It is God's good news that we simply have the opportunity to proclaim. This is the gospel that through Christ a holy God can not only forgive sinners, but completely rescue them from the penalty, the power, and the presence of condemning sin. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what Paul's saying? He's like, here's the boundaries. (laughs) Here's my calling order. Here's the duty. Gospel. Preach and teach and live the gospel. Okay, let's stop for a brief minute. We're we're already through verse 1. What's just happened? Right away in this book, in verse 1, and there's so many other ways and angles we could look at this verse to kind of help us understand it, but as we work through this, these descriptions of the Apostle Paul, what have we just gone through? We are confronted right away with this fact that the gospel of God is meant to change lives. This entire book is about the fact that Jesus changes lives. This is not some casual recognition of a really special guy named Jesus who did some really cool things 2,000 years ago. No, this gospel is meant to transform every part of our lives. Teenagers here today, young ones here today, young adults here today, moms and dads here today, grandmas and grandpas here today. As you're studying through the book of Romans, we're realizing that this is just not just pretty story. It is meant to change your life. This gospel will take a brilliantly proud sinner like the Apostle Paul and set him on the path of a humble yet joyful servant. This gospel will take a person completely antagonistic to the way of Christ and graciously allow him to be consumed with promoting that same Christ he used to antagonize. That's what the gospel does. And and right now, sitting right there, maybe in your own life, you're thinking about, oh man, those ten years of my life, oh dear. I hate those thoughts. Maybe that's what's going on in your mind right now. But brothers and sisters, friends, I'm telling you, this is a great Savior. He's looking at those times in your life and you're like, oh, I wish I could forgive those. And Jesus is looking at those times in your life and he's like, I used those. I transformed your life. A sinner saved by my amazing grace. And that's where we're at in this book and we're only in verse 1. And so let's go to verse 2. Paul, a servant of Christ, he says, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And now let's look more at this gospel because he takes the next series of verses and he can't help himself but explain the gospel. It's like, I got to share, a, in summarized form, highlights of this gospel, okay? So let's see some of the highlights of this gospel. Verse 2 which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Okay, what is this? Basically this. This good news isn't actually new news. It's all the way through your Bibles. <laughs> and Paul is saying, hey, you've heard this. It's, it's the Bible. 
The gospel is from the front of your Bibles to the end of your Bibles. And the the prophets here, generally speaking, of all those writing in the Old Testament, Paul is saying, God used these people to teach you and to preach to you that the gospel is coming, that Jesus Christ is the gospel. By the way, if if we were part of the Church of Rome here, meeting at this time, we're talking about AD 55, and we gathered together in homes and then in, in larger gathering, what would we have to study? Okay, you would have what Ezra put together and you would have the Old Testament sections of Scripture. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, if you remember the context we set up last week, there's some Gentile believers in this group that are like, what did we just read? Can you just kind of fly through that book of Deuteronomy? kind of like portions of Isaiah, but then it's like, woe is everything. And Jeremiah, man, this guy's sad. You hear what Paul's saying? He's like, every one of these books is pointing to someone. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. These people that would gather and study here in Rome and in different houses and in different congregations, they might at this point possibly have the word of some of the apostles penned in paper through the Spirit, known as, I'm talking about the story of Jesus, we're talking about the Gospels. They might have had some exposure to that, and they might have had some exposure from the other apostolic writings known as epistles, possibly. But by and large, what did they study every resurrection day, every Sunday morning when they gathered together to study? They would have studied the Old Testament, and here's what Paul is saying to them, guess what? There's Jesus, and there's Jesus, and there's Jesus, and there's the good news all the way through the Old Testament. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And that's what he says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And here it is, verse 3. Concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. Whew. This statement had enormous significance to these Roman believers. Why? Well, think about their context of life. We're talking about an audience living in the Roman Empire. Rome. With a culture driven by emperor worship. Being the lead guy was a big deal. Paul is reminding them that, in fact, Jesus, as the Bible that you study every time you get together, Jesus is the forever king who was promised by God to King David of the Old Testament Scriptures. This forever king, I mean, you can write down 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13. This forever king was coming. And what has Paul just done? He's reached into the context of life for these Romans and said, okay, you're entrenched in this lifestyle. What does the emperor say? What does the emperor say? What does the emperor say? Now he's saying, we're going to set a different course. Here's the course we're going to set. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? Why? Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. He was promised to David, and he is the forever king. Jesus was truly, as this verse says, according to the flesh. All right, what does that mean? Jesus was really flesh and blood. It is not in any way, as you'll find designated later on in the book of Romans, when we talk of flesh, we're talking about the enticement of sin, the, the temptation of sin, and the, 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 belief, uh, the embracing of some type of sin. This is not what he's saying. He's just simply saying Jesus had flesh and blood. Why is this important? Well, in this very same verse, we find that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is also the offspring of David. So what has he just proved to us in verse 3 of this book? Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man at the same time in order that he can 100% rescue. Right away we have a dynamic Christology in this book. And he continues on in verse 4. And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Right now, I would love to go to verses 3 and 4 and make all these comparisons because there's clear, some of you have already identified in your own personal studies, there's some clear clear structural comparison here from verses 3 and 4. 
But I just want to say this, verse 3, focusing on the humanity of Jesus through David. Verse 4 now focuses on his deity through the Holy Spirit of God. In order to understand verse 4, let's just very practically highlight this phrase. The Son of God in power. Because it's easy for us to kind of attach ourselves to some other words that are very enticing, like particularly the one declared, and to kind of get hung up on this word declared. But then we need to realize, what is, what is Paul saying here? He's focusing in on something. This is the Son of God with power. This is the Son of God in power, I should say. What is this? Well, think about this with me as we focus on the Son of God in power. Historically, what proved this phrase, the Son of God in power, over any other event in human history? It's what we celebrated a couple weeks ago. It is what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it's exactly why we gather on the first day of the week, Sunday morning. It is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is Paul recognizing from the onset in this book? Here's what he says. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. Please note this, that Jesus did not become the Son of God through the resurrection. Paul is not teaching, as some of you are familiar with, what's known as adoptionist Christology, that he just took on being the Son of God now after the resurrection. Rather, that through the resurrection he was decreed, he was determined, he was appointed as the Son of God in power. In other words, this, through the resurrection, no one in human history could ever doubt his distinct holy power, this Jesus. No one could ever doubt that he was truly the Son of God in power. And as such, he is to be considered as the last four words in this verse, which I absolutely love. Jesus Christ our Lord. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we now can affectionately, by God's grace, title this Savior as Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, Christ. And continuing with the servant terminology through this entire book and really through this entire salutation, he intentionally calls him Master Lord. And this carries us into verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. Paul uses these words, grace and apostleship. Again, remember, Understand that this is a personal testimony of Paul here. (laughs) He's not saying, you all need to be this apostles with me. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, this is what God has dynamically done in my life. Okay, and actually, if you take those two words, grace, this is undeserved favor and apostleship, being sent out with this, this special uh, position of apostleship. What is he saying? He's actually saying it probably, some of your translations might actually translate it this way. Gracious apostleship. (laughs) He's describing his apostleship as gracious. Romans, more than any other book, talks by Paul, any other book by Paul talks of this grace. It is receiving something that we did not deserve, and this falls directly in line with Paul's personal testimony. His whole testimony is what? Oh, I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve this. Oh, what does he say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says, I should be considered the least of all the apostles. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. And then he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what Paul's saying here. His gracious apostleship. I believe Paul is continuing to set the stage for the coming 16 chapters. And here it is. True faith includes the Gentiles, but it is only of God's grace and will lead to a transformed life of obedience. You're saying, what are you talking about? Well, look at the reason for this grace and apostleship. Here it is. To bring about the obedience of faith 
for the sake of his name among the nations. This is so good. Why was Paul blessed with this gracious apostleship? It wasn't for his own benefit. It was for the obedience of the faith to the nations. Um, that little phrase there, if I could back up to that last phrase, to bring about the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith, this is the obedience that comes from faith, and I believe also it could be referring to obedience that comes from faith. It's a lot to this phrase. I appreciate what one guy, Harvey, says. He says in his commentary, obedience to the call of faith, the gospel, this is talking about obedience to the call of faith that results in a lifestyle of faithful obedience. <laughs> it's not either or, it's both and. This faith and obedience go hand in hand. This is not some easy believism type faith. This shallow faith of just a recognition that this is a good guy, Jesus, who did some really cool things. Again, no, this is a transformational faith that leads to obedience. That is the word of God. And that is what we are compelled to do every single day of our lives. Uh, another guy who I really like his, his commentary, Tom Schreiner, says the belief first exercised upon conversion is validated as one continues to believe and obey. Such belief can never be separated from obedience and all obedience is rooted in and flows from faith. In other words, faith and obedience are intrinsically connected. James says it this way, true faith is obedient faith. Not to say that we won't trip up at times. James talks about this. Paul talks about this. Peter talks about this. But true faith is obedient faith. That is the theme of your New Testament epistles. And to what end? What is the purpose of all of what Paul is saying? And hold on, we'll be done here soon. What is the purpose of all of this? What, what is the purpose of this transformational life of, of Paul? I love this. To bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake of his name among the nations. This is so good. This is not somehow to make Paul feel really good about his ministry. This is not somehow to take Paul, even though he does tag into apostolic authority here in the second, first, second, third verses. It's not all about Paul. What is Paul saying right away in this book? It's not about me. It is about the sake of Jesus' name among the nations. I'm going to tell you, that is something that we can remind ourselves of every single day that we live. The fact of the matter is Jesus didn't save our souls just to bring some type of elitism into our hearts. Jesus saved our souls to promote his name among the nations. To live his grace among the nations. Who's the nations? the person you see at the gas station on Monday morning. It's your friend at school that's doubting whether they even want to live. It's that annoying neighbor that won't leave you alone with those texts about your dog. <laughs> it is that mechanic. It is that mailman. It is that businessman. That is the nations. That is who we are to bring the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to. Okay. Romans was wit written about the glorious, or about the gospel of the glorious Christ, and here it is now. We've been waiting for it. He's been talking about this testimony of what God's done in his life, and now he brings the church of Rome to the table, and he's saying, and you're part of the story. Here you are. You're a participant of God's grace. How does he say it? Verse 6, including you. <laughs> Who are, and here we are again with this word, called. You can't ignore it. You can't take white out and erase it. Called. This is not simply a passive general offer by God, but an intentional choice that leads to a purposeful acquisition. The same type of acquisition that we find from the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. I need, I want you. You're mine. That's what Jesus Christ does for every one of us who come to him by faith. I appreciate what a guy named Robert Mounts, and not everything I appreciate about his writings, but he says this, God's call is not an invitation, <laughs> but a powerful and effective reaching out to claim individuals for himself. 
You are mine. Brothers and sisters, friends, this is so good. This is grace. This is grace. We didn't deserve this. As we unpack and we go through chapters, the end of chapter 1 into 2 and 3, we're going to find very, very clearly that we don't deserve this. That we're sinners under the condemnation of a righteous God. But it is God's grace that He has saved us. As we work through this book, we realize that in absolutely no way do we deserve this calling. We are sinners of the nations, completely undeserving of God's grace, completely deserving of God's wrath. And this detail comes to us in the last verse of this section. Paul reminding all of us of this fact that Romans was written to God's chosen people. He uses the word called again. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Here we go. Saints. Holy ones. Dedicated to God. All right, so this is... Saints is not referring to some higher class of believers recognized by the church of Rome for special acts of ministry, but all believers who have ever through faith been saved by God's grace. So in a positional sense, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. Yes, even R.G., Yes, even David Scott. Yes, even Mike Woods or Lonnie McKenzie. Yes, even Mark Barons. Yes, even Steve Guido or Lonnie. Yes, any, any of us. I don't know about that Dave Messier guy, but I guess we can kind of consider him the same because Jesus does. This is what we're talking about. We are called to be saints. He got us. He grabbed us and He's chosen us to be saints. His people. You are mine. What has Paul just done? Once again, from the onset, he is proving the power of the gospel to change the lives of all who are in Rome. And that is a very intentional word there. All. Remember the historical context. He's not just talking to the Jews or the Gentiles. He's saying all who come to Jesus Christ in faith are called to be saints and loved by God. Here's the biblical fact, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we wrap this up. God is in the business of acquiring sinners and transforming them into saints. Praise God that this is a story of your Bible, a story that we're going to see in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God showed his love to us, and while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is the fact, as John says in 1 John 4, 19. My little daughter, Emma, is learning this before she goes to bed. I start it and she finishes it. And Eva as well. We love him because he first loved us. We've got to get this in our minds. Ultimately, here it is. You did not choose God. God chose you. Okay, sure, this concept of divine, election, of divine election comes with a lot of questions that make many uncomfortable. Sure, you will never be able to completely figure it out because of your finite mind. Sure, it has been used. We're talking about divine election. It has been used and abused by some. But friends, if we truly believe the Bible and truly want to understand Romans, we cannot stiff arm this concept of divine election. We must embrace it. You're not going to be able to completely understand this, but you know what? You have to believe it. And you have to embrace it because God says these things. Not me. And it wasn't even, remember, this is the gospel of God that Paul is writing about here. We will talk more of this as you see this unpacked through the book of Romans. But here's the fact that in spite of ourselves, we are recipients of God's amazing grace. And we're reminded of this as Paul closes out this section in our minds. This section it leads right into his personal testimony that we'll look at next week. But here it is, verse 7. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't about to end this section out without reminding them of the genuine care of Almighty God. 
grace to you in peace. And you've often heard of these terms. We're going to see these unpacked throughout the entire book. But basically this, Paul uses terms that both Jewish and Gentile believers would recognize. He reminds his readers that God, the loving Father, provides unearned kindness and incomparable peace. And how does this unmerited kindness and incomparable peace come? Only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what? We just went through some amazing verses this morning. Every word of this voicemail counted. <laughs> Every word did. And honestly, we, we scratched the surface. I mean, my note pages this week. It's like, no way. Well, one, one of the ways, one of the reasons for doing this study is to entice your study throughout the week. I want you to go home and dig into some of these passages and these phrases to make application in your life. But here's a simple so what that I want to dial in on this morning. As we talked about the blessing of being considered a servant of Jesus Christ, and it is a blessing to be a servant of Jesus Christ. As we talked about the gospel of a glorious Christ, as we talked about being Jesus' people, in other words, being called, he's like, I want you to be my person. We talked about being called to be a saint. We talked about grace and peace. What's a so what? And I think we've got to ask this question. Have you responded to God's call? What do I mean? It's no mistake that you're here today. It's no mistake. There's no mistake of a sovereign God that the Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus. There's no mistake that you're hearing these verses t that talk about this glorious Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I have a question for you. Will you respond in faith? That is the book of Romans. Will you respond to this call? My friends, over and over again, every single week, we're going to hear more and more about this beautiful Jesus, about this glorious gospel. We're going to hear more of the care of this righteous God. But the question that we're going to be asked every single week is, have you responded to God's call? There's no mistake that you are here, that you are listening, that God is drawing you to Himself right now. And will you respond in faith? There are some here right now, sitting here, that you have responded in faith. And you look back in your life and you're like, yes, I did respond in faith to Almighty God. Well then I want to quickly go to what the Apostle Paul says here. You are called to belong to Jesus. You were called to be a what? Saint. So very easily in our lives we're enticed. We're enticed to forget about the beauty of the gospel that's meant to transform our lives. To see that enticement that Satan puts out in front of us and the world says, come after this. And one of the purposes of our study through the book of Romans is that we constantly hold up Jesus Christ, hold up our position in Christ, and say, by God's grace, let us live as Jesus' people. Let us live by His grace as people who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Let us live differently this week because Jesus looked down on my life and said, I want you. And so God, that is the prayer of our hearts this morning. I want to thank you for how Paul just explodes through your spirit and in summary of this gospel and this passage we looked at today. And God, as this excites us to look more and more deeply at this, this book, I pray that you would direct us by your spirit through this book to constantly remind ourselves that you are God and we are not, to constantly by faith trust what you say in your word. That is our prayer. Well, Lord, I know there are some here right now that you're drawing to yourself. Oh, I pray, Father, that today would be the day that they obey your call. 
I come to you in repentant faith.